Hello again, this is Zengo MD. Let's talk a little bit about dermal fillers. Even though they've been around for well over 30 years, there's still a great deal of urban legend about them and what they can do for you. Many people are not aware of what dermal fillers even exist in the marketplace, even though, believe it or not, we have not seen a completely new and unique filler FDA approved in over 13 years. I'll start with a quick review and then show you one simple thing that you can do at home right now to see if you're a dermal filler candidate and then help you get the most for your dermal filler investment by choosing the right one and the right approach. Well, it all began in the 1980s with collagen fillers like this one. They never became very popular in part due to a short duration of only three to four months and an annoyingly high rate of allergic reactions. It wasn't until 2003 when the natural hyaluronic acid fillers like Restylane and Juvederm eliminated the allergic reaction risk and tripled the duration at about the same cost. And dermal fillers launched just a few years after Botox took the country by storm, created a second wave in injectable aesthetics that is still here and thriving today. Now, a second generation of more flexible hyaluronic acid fillers have been introduced under brand names like Restylane Refine and Define and Volbella and Velour, to name a few. There are other hyaluronic acid fillers. It's just these mainly have the majority of the market share. Soon after Restylane and Juvederm hit, we got some novel synthetic fillers approved, which are still used today. Sculpture came first, followed by Radiesse, and the permanent filler, Bellafill. More about these in a minute. As more providers started offering fillers in the years 2004 to 2010, many started to push the boundaries of good judgment. This is America and more is better, right? But this led to easily recognizable syndrome of overdone filler face. Most of the time, this was evident in overinflated lips, but even cheeks and other areas were not immune to these overzealous attempts at restoring the fountain of youth too much too soon. But the start of the second decade of fillers arrived, and we've learned that more is definitely not better. There are a number of FDA-approved indications for facial fillers. Most are approved for lines like the nasolabial folds, but also marionette lines and lip corners respond in a similar manner. Some are approved for very targeted indications like volume loss due to HIV, but are used by most people in an off-label capacity for any area of the face, like the hollows of the cheeks or slightly above here to lift soft tissue off the cheekbones. Lips are another area of approved use for some fillers, along with the wrinkles above the mouth. Some off-label uses like tear troughs and glabella and orbital hollows can be very rewarding if done well, but they have a downside lurking, and they've been associated with around 50 reported cases of blindness in the literature. Whoa. Here are some great treatment examples using hyaluronic acid. You can do a lot with a little filler in places like shadowy lip corners. Less than half a syringe gets you a nice result, or this lip corner and upper lip wrinkle combination. A little more filler is needed to tackle deeper folds like marionette lines and nasolabial folds. All four of these are great results on patients who could really benefit from the right dose of dermal filler. These are the perfect combination of the right provider choosing the right filler for the right patient. When looking at the FDA approved dermal fillers, one must always start with the hyaluronic acid agents. Either the traditional ones like Restylane and Juvederm or the newer formulations, again like Refine or Volbella. These have around 90% of the market share of dermal filler treatments, and that alone says a lot. This is a natural product. The natural molecule is linked together in a slightly unnatural way to allow it to last around nine months. It's affordable, predictable, and does not cause skin reactions known as granulomas because it cannot stimulate abnormal tissue. The other agents, Sculpture and Radiesse, have longer durations, which can be tempting to some, but they can cost more and can overstimulate tissue. Even a year later, they can overstimulate tissue, resulting in nodules or granulomas. The duration of use can be variable depending on how much each patient uniquely reacts to each filler, so your mileage may vary. Finally, permanent fillers sounded great 10 years ago, but they've never gained very much market share for obvious reasons. They are the most expensive and have the highest rate of side effects, which can happen many years later. None of these last three agents can be easily reversed either. So if they don't look less than perfect when they're done, you have to wait for them to wear off. What's interesting is that the ability to fill folds has actually changed our view of aging and changed it back again. See, it was always felt that aging was due to gravitational effects on our faces. 
way back when it was considered appropriate to even remove fat from the face to try to make us look younger. However, when the post-collagen group of fillers emerged, our view of aging changed, as illustrated by this article from 2007, which notes that the gravitational influence is important, but it puts even more emphasis on the loss of volume as the cause of aging. This change of opinion, fueled, of course, by the availability of dermal fillers, led to many providers being taught to fill something to try to lift it against gravity, to actually use fillers to counteract the well-known tried and true gravitational effect. Now, something like that we know today to be a bit incorrect and a bit of an overuse of fillers. See, nowadays we view gravitational and volume loss as two equally important causes of facial aging, but they're very different in their cause and very different in their treatment. Here's a before and after of a typical patient. She looks pretty good, don't you think? What did they do? What fillers do you think she got? And how much? Are you ready for this? All she did was lie down. Not a single needle, filler, or suture touched her face. Nothing. See, when you lie down, you remove the effect of gravity on your face. But volume loss can still be appreciated. It will be reduced, but it will still be seen, like in the areas around her nasolabial folds, marionette lines, and upper lip. You can still see that there's some volume loss. So if she wants to look like the photo on the right when she's standing up, then she needs some stitches, most likely. Something to pull and defy gravity. All fillers can do for gravitational aging is put up a dam in the nasolabial fold to try to prevent the cheek from falling. It's really not the best use of fillers, and they can't ever lift fat out of the way. So a facelift plus a little fillers would really be the best treatment. See, the face has fat pads and compartments, and while each compartment can deflate at different rates in different people, that's volume loss and that needs filler, these little white support ligaments can stretch or break, causing part of the fat pad to then fall to the floor. The best example of that is the jowl, as you see here. When this fat pad breaks free in a lot of Caucasians, but very rarely in Asians, and it falls below the jawline. In order to do the right thing for your face, both you and your provider need to think of these fat pads and their boundaries before choosing a treatment option. I will leave you with the following points to consider the next time you want to look at dermal fillers. First, fillers fill folds. If the fold is there at rest and when you lie down, then you're a great candidate. But don't try to fill a fold that's only present when you make expressions and not at rest. Because what will that look like when you're at rest? It could look like a mound if you're filling a fold that only happens when you're moving your face. Next, fillers don't lift. They may reinflate the face off the bone if you purchase and inject enough of them, but they don't lift the face up off the ground. Don't let someone promise you that they can use fillers in one part of the face to achieve a lift in another part of the face because it will never be the best look for you. It will be too much volume and too expensive. Next, lie down and take a peek. Use a magnifying mirror. Even if you only lie down at a slight angle and not flat, you will begin to get an idea for what needs to be filled and what is caused by gravity. Next, choose your filler carefully. Is going to two visits, two little visits over 18 months, really that much worse than going to one visit in 18 months if splitting your treatment into two reduces side effects and gives you the opportunity to change your look as your face changes due to age or even changes in weight? I've seen people get permanent fillers and lose weight only to reveal mounds of Bellafill that didn't change as their face changed. Next, I strongly recommend one syringe at a time. For my patients, I find it works best to make a base layer of filler, let it firm up, and then add more if needed to make the peaks instead of trying to build a big mountain of jelly too tall, too fast, only to have it collapse when the patient goes home, lays on her side, rubs on it, or who knows what happens. Less is always more. You can always add a second syringe in a few weeks for a more dramatic and probably longer lasting effect than doing two syringes piled high at one visit. And finally, your face is going to change. And whatever you think looks great might change as well. Keep that in mind when considering a long-term or permanent filler because these agents are not reversible. 
Think of a dermal filler as just ongoing maintenance, like getting a couple new pairs of eyeglasses or changing fashions. You can decide the level of the effect you want each time. It's not a one-shot, pardon the pun, event. So that's all for me. Go get that handheld mirror and see how your face changes as you lie down and picture those fat pads and ligaments and see how they respond. Then choose the most experienced provider who looks at your face the same way we did today and is committed to helping you look your best, not just sell you the most expensive options. Don't forget to hit subscribe and follow us for more great tips on how to be an empowered patient in aesthetic and wellness medicine. Bye.